what happens when you give, we're not trying to take your money. We're trying to get money to you. Amen. And uh, we're trying to help you grow and, and prosper in the things of God. And uh, God is a God of blessing. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, I, I just, I, I, can I say that? I'll just say it this way. You know, there's people that, that will say, well, you know, you guys are just uh, in that health and wealth gospel. Uh, absolutely. I, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know of another gospel. Amen. But, uh, you know, that by default, that just leaves the sickness and poverty gospel. And <laughs> that's not that's not the gospel that I see in the word. Amen. So uh, praise the Lord. Let's um, let's get these things set up. Uh, we're going to get in the word this morning. If you want to open your Bible with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 12, we're going to start off there with um, Abram. God speaking to Abram. In Genesis chapter 12, or yeah, Genesis chapter 12, that's right, isn't it? Genesis chapter 12 and verse 2, and uh, let's see here. Years and years ago, as we get into this, um, actually a couple decades ago, it was, it was that long ago, uh, God began to speak to Patricia and I, and this is one of the verses that he uh, started to use to reveal this to us. But uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, God here is speaking to Abram before he becomes Abraham. Oh, by the way, I just while I brought this up here. We, uh, we have some gear that's available <laughs> now. And uh, this, is, this is my Eastern Kentucky shall be saved hat. Amen. And uh, we got hats and T-shirts and all kinds of stuff. So uh, just check. I, I think there's a link on Facebook. Um, you can check those out and. I think these are really, really good conversation starters. Hey, that's that's interesting. Why is Eastern Kentucky red? And it's because we expect that Eastern Kentucky is going to be washed in the blood of Jesus. Amen. So it gives uh, gives you a, a reason to share that vision and, and talk to people about it. And there's some other stuff, coffee mugs and uh, other other kinds of stuff out there too. Uh, in addition to that, we have. Um, a second time published author in our midst here this morning. <laughs> Amen. It's Bo, a.k.a. Billy L. Go, and uh, he just published his second book. Amen. <laughs> it's out there on the table, and it's available on Amazon.com. It's, it's a good book. I call that book, it's, it's like a little mini novel, and uh, it tells a story about a family and and I won't, uh, I won't tell you the whole story, but it's, it's good. It's, uh, it deals with a subject that a lot of families, I think, deal with and don't deal with it very well. But um, they dealt with it through relationship with God and through faith, and they were able to conquer things that, that other families struggle with and that end up spinning out of control. So, uh, But it's a good book. It's a good one. So be sure you check that out. And um, you can look at the one that we have out there, but don't take that one with you. That one's... <laughs> For display purposes only. Amen. But Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, this is God speaking to Abram, and he says, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So four things there. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make of you a great nation. Now, what does that mean? That just means he's going to have a lot of kids, right? His kids are going to have a lot of kids. And in fact, we go on, and uh, if we read through um, Genesis 12 and, and deeper into Genesis, where God was revealing things to Abram. Uh, we would discover that God at one point told Abram, he said, uh, look at this, the sand of the sea shore, and that's how your seed, that's the number that your seed will be. Uh, it's too many to count, right? And he said, look up at the stars of the sky. Anybody ever try to count the stars in the sky? I've tried to do that at least once, and just can't do it. it there's just too many. <laughs> Amen. So, um, but th these are God's promises to Abram. And he said, I don't even know, a Abram, is, uh, Abram becomes Abraham, who is the father of our faith, right? Abram becomes the father of our faith. And so these promises that God gives to Abram are promises that are in the Bible for you and me. And uh, I want to focus in on one particular thing here. He says, I'm going uh, to make of you a great nation, and I'm going to... Uh, do you need these? <laughs> I'm going to bless you, and 
I'm going to make your name great. And I want to focus in on that phrase right there. I want to make your name great. Now, this is not uh, Abram speaking to God. This is God speaking to Abram. And when God first began to speak to us, uh, Patricia and myself, about um, making the name great, we did a little research and we looked that name up. And the name means more than just Bill or Bob or Susie or Jill. It, it's uh, in, in the original Hebrew, it has a reference to reputation. Okay? So when he talks about name, it's talking about reputation. Okay? How many of you know as a believer, as a Christian, it's a really, really, really good idea for you to have a good reputation? And, uh, you know, people look at you and, you know, your reputation is that you steal from people, that you cuss, you tell dirty jokes, you cheat on your spouse. Uh, I mean, that's not a good reputation, is it? <laughs> that's not the kind of reputation that we want in the kingdom of God. We want a good reputation. And here, God is saying to Abram, I'm going to make your reputation great. Yeah, I'm going to make uh, I'm going to make of you a, a great nation. I'm going to bless you, but I'm going to make your reputation great. You're not going to become great. Uh, and people say, well, he cheated his way to the top. You know, he did. Every, he, he stole, begged, stole and borrowed, you know, everything that he could. And that's how he became great. No, that's not how this is going to happen. He says, along with these blessings, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make your reputation great. So as people in the body of Christ, it's important for our reputation to be great. God said he would make it great. Amen. But as uh, God began to reveal this to us, we were touched in our hearts. And we said, you know what? Um, I, we want to make God's reputation great. How many of you know in some places God's reputation is not that great? You know, in some places people will say God makes people sick to teach them a lesson. And... Uh, <laughs> If, if you have ever been told that or, or believed that or said that, then uh, I want to encourage you with this thought this morning is that, you know, I, I came out of denominations where they taught that and they believed that. And, and uh, I, at the same time, I never saw one person who ever got sick who ever learned the lesson that they were supposedly supposed to learn from being sick. Not only that, but most of them were going back and forth to the doctor constantly trying to get unsick. So <laughs> I think they probably didn't believe that God had put that sickness on them either to teach them a lesson because they weren't really trying to learn a lesson. God wasn't trying to teach them a lesson. How many of you know God can't make people sick because he, he doesn't have any sickness? There's no sickness in heaven. He doesn't have any. And so it's the thief, right? Jesus said in John 10, 10, it's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? And so thank God that he's given us authority over the thief. He's given us the authority over the one who could bring sickness and disease and could try to steal, kill, and destroy things out of our life. We have authority over that in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. So, um, but uh, we were touched in our hearts, and we thought, you know what? I want to make God's name great. I want to make his reputation great. And part of what we're doing right now is that. When we're exposing things like God doesn't make you sick to teach you a lesson. Um, he doesn't make you poor to keep you humble. You know, I was uh, scheduled to go to a church and preach one time. This was over 20 years ago. And, and uh, the pastor kept telling me, he said, well, we'll keep you poor and we'll let the Lord keep you humble. <laughs> and it was a big church. It had two services on Sunday morning, uh, several hundred in attendance of both services. And then I, I preached both services Sunday morning. Preached Sunday night. They, they didn't receive any offering for me at all, which that's not why I was there, but I was there to teach the word, and which I did. But uh, no offering on either service Sunday morning. Sunday night they took up an offering, but he stood up in the middle of my message, and uh, he shut me down, basically, the pastor did. And uh, I was teaching on the glory of God. I was teaching how, basically, along the lines that I, I just mentioned, how God doesn't make people sick. God is not bringing curse on people. God is removing curse from people. Amen. And he, uh, he stood up and shut me down because obviously they didn't believe that. And uh, so I ended up having to close that service early. And uh, oops, it was, a, it was a learning experience. But uh, Patricia and I were touched in our hearts. We wanted to make God's name great. Amen. And change his reputation. Because how many of you know, if somebody really believes or they've been told that God does make you sick to teach you something or that God uh, killed babies and, 
God's responsible for all this death and sickness and disease, and God's responsible for poverty, and God's re responsible for wars, and God's responsible for all these things, then, then it, it can be hard for some people to come to God because they do not see him as a loving God, which he is. Are you following what I'm saying this morning? So it's important that people understand the, very, the true nature of God and who he really is and how he really is. And so we felt like it was a part of our ministry to make God's name great, to make his reputation great. I've discovered in the probably 20 years since then that God is not really altogether too concerned about his reputation. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter to him what you think about him, but it does matter to him what people think about you. And that is why in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, God doesn't say, Abram, I want you to make my name great. He says, Abram, I want to make your name great. Amen. And so it matters to God what people think about you. God wants to make your name great. And if we look in the book of Colossians chapter 4, chapter 3, I'm sorry, uh, book of Colossians chapter 3, we'll find out why, we'll get a little bit of an insight into why God doesn't really care too much about his reputation, making his name great, about you making his name great. He wants to make your name great. He wants to make your reputation great because, um, oh, wrong book, Colossians, I'm in Galatians. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4, it says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Let's read verse 3. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. How many of you know that you are, you are in God? You are in Jesus. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 says that we are seated with him in heavenly places. We are in him. He is in us. Uh, we could go back up to Colossians chapter 3, read all those verses 1 through 4, and it gives us that insight. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. And so when God says, I want to make your name great, I want to make your reputation great. Literally, he's making his reputation great because you are in him and he is in you. Hallelujah. So again, he's not going to do it by, uh, by having you steal, beg, steal, and borrow. He's not going to have you do it by breaking the law. He's not going to have you do it by being um, morally corrupt. He's going to do it by the principles of the word of God. And when you prosper and when you walk in divine health and when you see victories and when you receive healings and when God touches your life and when God begins to do things in your life that other people wish that would happen in their life, then God is not just making your name great. God's making his name great in you because he's inside you. Amen. All right. Uh, let's see. I want to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And this is uh, the really popular passage of Scripture that talks about Jehoshaphat. It was king of Judah. Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And uh, I want to read a, a few verses there, beginning with verse 3. And then we're going to skip down to verse 17. Um, but in verse 3, here we have Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat is in a place here where he's got three armies that have assembled themselves against Judah. Uh, three armies have come out against him. And it says right here in verse 3, Jehoshaphat was afraid. He was afraid. Now, sometimes we get afraid of circumstances. Sometimes things happen and... Uh, it can cause us to be concerned. That's another word for fear. <laughs> it can cause us to be concerned, amen? And uh, I love what Jehoshaphat did because he didn't just sit there and wring his hands. He didn't just, um, <laughs> he didn't just seek worldly counsel. He sought the Lord, amen? And uh, turn over to verse 17 there. Um, this is God's response 
when Je- Jehoshaphat, and this is exactly what he should have, this is exactly what we should do when we are experiencing fear, when we are experiencing concern about anything, we don't need to just ignore God. And I, I made a video the other day, one of my little daily devotional videos. I said, you know, there's three, basically, there's three responses to when uh, something happens that is causing you fear or something happens that's causing you concern that you don't know what to do. There's three responses. One is that you can completely ignore the fact that God even exists, and you can just wring your hands over the situation. You can worry about it. You can fret about it. You can do whatever you do in the natural to try to remedy the situation, but just completely ignore the fact that God exists. The second option that you have is you can blame God for it, and that's, that's a, as big or worse mistake as number one is. You can blame God for it, and a lot of people do that. God, why did you do this? God, why did you make me sick? God, why did you take so-and-so from me? God, why did you uh, not, uh, not come through when I really needed you? God, why, why, why? You know, Joyce Meyer has this amazing message. It's called, Why God, Why, When God, Win, right? And so, <laughs> amen. But uh, that's the second option. Blame God. How many of you know that's not going to get you very far? When you blame God for stuff, you're not going to get very far. So the third the third option here is the best option, and it's what King Jehoshaphat did. He set himself to seek the Lord. And so that's what we should do. That's the best option. Seek the Lord. Amen. Doesn't God say that in his word? He says, hey, seek the Lord while he may be found. Seek me early while, he, while I may be found, right? And so the third option, the best option is seek the Lord. That's what Jehoshaphat did. He was afraid. Three armies were coming out against him. And when he decided to seek God, then God responded to him. In verse 17, it says, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Well, that would be awesome. Amen. If you ever had a battle, if you ever had a spiritual battle, and you felt like you were all alone, and you were having to deal with this thing and face this thing all by yourself, that you didn't have any help, nobody else has ever experienced anything like the battle that I'm going through right now. And isn't that every battle that we have? (laughs) Amen. But uh, God speaks to Jehoshaphat. Why? Because he was afraid, but he sought God. And God speaks to him and says, listen, you're not even going to need to fight in this battle. And what does he go on to say? This is the prophet giving him the word of the Lord here. But he says, here's what you're going to do. I want you to put the singers, I want you to put the, the praisers, I want you to put the, 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 the musicians who skillfully play on their instruments, I want you to take those people and I want you to put them up in the front lines. And so that's what Jehoshaphat did. I said here, I think, you know, a couple weeks ago that, uh, you know, I I wouldn't want to do that. (laughs) I wouldn't want to take the worship team. I like the worship team. Here I am the worship team. (laughs) I'm I'm part of the worship team here. And so, you know, that's, uh, but, you know, in Lexington, we we attend there on Wednesday nights. And uh, I love the worship team. They've got sometimes 10 people on the worship team, singers and drummers and guitarists and bass players and keyboard players and, and backup singers. And I mean, it's just an amazing uh, lineup of, of talent that they have, and they're anointed. And I'm like thinking, well, if I had to put them up on the front lines, that's, that's, I don't want to do that. I, I would run the risk of losing them, and I don't want to lose them. I don't want them to die because I like what they do. <laughs> I like how they sing. I like how they play the instruments. Amen? So this is what Jehoshaphat was told. And sometimes when God tells us something, just like what he told Jehoshaphat here, um, it doesn't make any sense. How many of you know in the natural, when you put praisers and you put musicians up in the front line, you could expect them to be the first ones to get killed. But beyond that, you wouldn't be able to expect that they're going to have the ability to Uh, kill any of the enemy, to destroy any of the enemy that's coming against you. So it doesn't make sense. Sometimes, listen, this is a point, sometimes God tells you to do something that doesn't make sense. Right? And in those times, when you do what God tells you to do, it tethers you to a miracle. Come on, somebody. Well... You're going to have to qualify that statement, Pastor. Anytime you tell, any, anytime God tells you what to do and you do it, it tethers you to a miracle that you are then to obey God, to do what He tells you to do, and it will pull that miracle into your life. I can't tell you how many times that we have been facing something financially. I'll just use that as an example. 
uh, we've been facing something financially in our life where we didn't have the money, we didn't know what to do, and God, we, we sought God, you know, try to bring fear, try to bring concern, but we sought God, and God said, I want you to sow a, a, a seed into pastor. And we would take, uh, write out a check, and we would sow a seed into our pastor. And I'm not telling you that because I'm trying to influence you. Although I am, but not to sow seed into us. I'm trying to influence you to obey God. But when we would do that, it would be like a miraculous thing would happen. The need somehow would get met. The, the, the thing that we were facing, somehow it would be resolved every single time. Every single time. And usually, supernaturally, where we, it was like we, we couldn't have expected that to happen. We couldn't have told somebody this is what we think is going to happen. No, God just did it in a way that only God could figure it out. And we were so blessed by that. And in those times, that was God making our name great. And he's making his name great at the same time. Amen. Why does he do that? Well, because he knows when you seek him and he tells you to do something and you do it, then he's going to break forth on your behalf. He's going to... He's going to cause a miracle to come into your life. And this is not just with finances. This is with healing. So many times that I have had a sickness or a, a symptom in my body or pain in my body, and, you know, I'm working the Word, and I'm speaking and confessing Scripture over it, and it's not working or it's just working really slow, and I've, I would seek God. And I would ask God, God, what do you want me to do? Why? Because I know when God gives you a Word that... That word ties you to a miracle that when you obey it, you're pulling that miracle into your life. And time after time after time, when I needed a healing, and I did that, I sought God, and I asked God, what do you want me to do? And God told me what to do. Then that healing manifested, and that symptom never returned. Hallelujah. You know, in John chapter 2, verse 5, Jesus at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. And the Bible will tell you in the book of John chapter 2 that this was the very first miracle that Jesus ever did. And his mom told him, Jesus, they've run out of wine, do something. And Jesus said, it's not yet my time. And she just looked at the servants and she said, hey, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Right? And so he was like, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> and so he tells the servants, you take these six water pots of stone and you fill them full to the brim with water. And when they had done that, he told them, okay, now you dip it out, dip out and take it to the governor of the feast. And they did it. You know, I don't know if I'd have done that. <laughs> if I was one of the servants, I'd have been like, you know, hey, Bo, you, you, I'll be right behind you, man. <laughs> You go first. <laughs> Amen. But so many times it doesn't make sense what God tells you to do. But whatever he tells you to do, when you do it, a miracle is about to happen in your life. Now, I shared a lot of this a couple weeks ago when I was talking about, um, you know, not, not just having enough energy to, to fight your way out of the corner, but to come out into the ring uh, swing in, come out of that corner, and get ultimate victory. That's, that's what we're promised, amen. That's what we believe for. We want ultimate victory, amen. And so this is what a picture of ultimate victory looks like. Um, in the book of Luke chapter 5, you know, when Peter and uh, his, his buddies had been out fishing all night, we know that because that's what he told Jesus. Jesus was teaching in this boat. And when he was finished teaching, the Bible says Jesus looks at Peter and he says, Cast out into the deep, Peter, and let down your nets for a draft. And Peter said, Master, we have been fishing all night. We've been toiling. He said, toiling. We've been working. It's work. <laughs> I don't even know it's work when you fish all night and you don't catch anything. That's when it's work, right? If you caught a bunch of stuff, it's less like work. <laughs> He said, we've been working and toiling all night long, and we didn't catch anything. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Pastor Callahan, who used to be our, our pastor, he's moved to heaven. But uh, when he would, uh, somebody would be preaching, and he, they would say something that 
was just goofy. He would uh, have this look on his face. They called it the tilt. He would, if, if Stacy just said something goofy, he would get the tilt. So <laughs> I kind of see, you know, Jesus giving Peter the tilt right there. And when, when Peter said, we've been up fishing all night. Lord, we didn't catch anything. And Peter just told him, launch out into the deep, let down your nets for a draft. And Peter says, we've been up fishing all night. That's not what I asked you, Peter. We've been up fishing all night. We didn't catch anything. And then Jesus, I just believe, just gave him the tilt. <laughs> and so Peter says, nevertheless, at your word, <laughs> at your word, I will launch out into the deep and let down my net, nets for a draft. And he did. What happened? So he obeys the word from Jesus. What happens? Peter's not just fighting his way out of the corner here. Peter pulls in. This is where preachers get excited when they talk about this, uh, this thing that happened. They say, all right. And then, then what happened? There was a net breaking, boat sinking load of fish. And that does preach. That's a really good, that's a really good preaching message. Amen. Well, that's what happened. When Peter obeyed Jesus, then there were more fish than what he could fit in his net. They had to call their neighbors, they had to call their partners. Hey, guys, come over here. My boat's about to sink. My nets are breaking. I need your help. I need your boat. I need your nets. And their, their nets were so full, they were about to break. And their boat was almost about to sink. So this is more than just fighting your way out of the corner. This is recognizing that when God tells me to do something and I do it, I have to recognize that God's not just trying to put me through extra work. God's not asking me to do something that I've already done, already did this a thousand times. It never worked before, but now God's telling me to do it this time. And so what can I expect? Because of my history, because of all my experience, I really can't expect that anything is going to happen any different. But the difference is now that God said. The difference now is that Jesus has spoken and released the word into your life. And when you obey that word that Jesus spoke to you, now it is tied to your miracle, and a miracle is about to enter your boat. Hallelujah. That haul of fish that they brought in right there was more than just dinner for Peter and the disciples. That, that went to the market. I don't know how much they would have made off of that haul of fish, but it was significant. Amen. Um, did I share this? I feel like I shared this a couple weeks ago, too. You know, when he said, at your word, nevertheless, at your word, I'll do this. And a couple other places in Scripture where we find that phrase or a, a, um, a close proximity of that phrase is in the book of Luke chapter 1 when the angel appears unto Mary and he says, uh, Mary, you found favor in the sight of God. And he says, you're going to bring forth a son. You're going to call his name Jesus. He's going to be the Savior of the world. I'm paraphrasing. But he's going to be the Savior of the world. And Mary just sitting there listening to that. And, and I just can imagine Mary be like, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, what? I got, I got hung up on you're going to have a son. <laughs> because she said, how can this be? I, seeing I, I don't even know a man. I've never been with a man. How can this be? And so the angel went on to explain a little bit more about what, 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 uh, what was going to happen to her. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is going to come over uh, and overshadow you and and. You're going you're to conceive a child. You're going to bring forth and you know, explain the whole thing, the way it was going to happen. And Mary, because this is one of the reasons why the Bible describes her as being more virtuous than anybody else in her age. She responded to Angel Gabriel with these words. She said, according to your word, be it unto me. According to your word, be it unto me. What's happening right there? D did you know that to this day there is an entire denomination of believers that don't pray to Jesus? They pray to Mary. <laughs> they do. God made, God made Mary's name great. But every time we talk about Mary, it's because she received the word of God through the angel. And it happened exactly the way the angel said. 
She just received it. And a miracle happened. And then we talked about it in the book of 1 Kings chapter 18 when Elijah was building the altar and having that confrontation with the prophets of Baal. And, uh, you know, they all, they both constructed their altars and uh, Baal never showed up for, for his prophets. Uh, but when it came time and they broke Elijah's altar down and destroyed it and he had to rebuild it again. And sometimes it's worth the work. Amen. Sometimes when you know what's going to happen, Sometimes when you know your God, like the Bible says in the book of Daniel, chapter 11, verse 32, when you know your God, you don't mind to get involved and do some exploits because you know what's going to happen. You know that God is going to show up. You know that God is not going to disappoint you. Why? We find out in the book of uh, 1 Kings, chapter 18, when Elijah uh, was about to call fire down from heaven and prove that God, the God that we serve, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that He is the one true and living God, that Baal is not a God, the devil is not a God. God is far surpassing in power, in superiority. He is far surpassing in greatness. There is no God like our God. Hallelujah. And so Elijah knew God like this. And he prayed before he calls fire down from heaven. And he says, God, I just want everybody to know that I only did this at your word. Because you said so. This is the only reason I did it. And when he did what God told him to do, what happened? Miracle. A miracle happened. And so I'm doing my best to get back to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Here's what happened with Jehoshaphat. God speaks to him through the prophet and says, okay, I want you to put the musicians out front. I want you to put the praisers out front and uh, have them go out in the front and sing praises unto me. And if you ever wondered why when uh, we encourage you to praise God, when we say, okay, this is the reason why we praise God. We want you to praise. We want you to be a praiser. We want you to lift your hands. We want you to raise your voice. We want you to make a joyful noise if you don't know how to sing. We want you to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Why? And one of the reasons why is because of what we find right here in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Because that's what God told Jehoshaphat to do. To put the praisers out front. To put the singers out front. The musicians out front. Because when they went out to battle and they began to sing and they began to play on their instruments and they began to praise God... God sent something into the camp of the enemy, and it turned them on themselves. All three of those armies started to turn on themselves, and they destroyed one another until, what does the Bible say there in 2 Chronicles chapter 20? There was not one of them left. Not one left. They destroyed each other. And what God said was true. You're not even going to have to fight in this battle. So when we tell you that we want you to praise God, when you praise God when you ask Him for uh, the manifestation, not when the manifestation comes. You praise Him beforehand because that's what we see right here. They went out and they praised God, and when they praised God, the enemy fell before their face. Now they've boxed their way out of the corner. Now is when the work begins. But it's not, it's work is not like work. When is work not like work? You know, there's people that say, you will never work a day in your life if you love what you do. <laughs> Amen. We were here yesterday, honey, how long were we here? We worked. We worked about 11 hours, pretty much, yesterday. Me up and down off the scaffolding and wiring a light that doesn't switch on. <laughs> I have to take it back down and fix it. <laughs> but it looks pretty. And uh, I, by the time I laid my head down on the pillow last night, I was exhausted. But, why, but I slept really good. Amen. Why am I telling you that? What was I talking about? <laughs> oh. And so... I was concerned, you know, a little bit about standing up and preaching to you this morning because, you know, honestly, even when I woke up this morning, I felt tired. And I could still feel my body. Soreness, you know, from legs. I don't know, maybe you wouldn't be this way, but standing up on the scaffolding that's, I mean, it says it's about 
six feet, I guess. About six feet high. So when I stand up on the scaffolding, my head is about this far from the ceiling. So six feet doesn't sound very high until you're up on it. And you might be different if it was you, but pretty much the whole time I'm on the scaffolding, I feel like my legs are just tense. <laughs> like I'm just bracing, you know, the whole time. Because uh, you've never been on our scaffolding, but our scaffolding, it jiggles. <laughs> and it wiggles. <laughs> and it moves and stuff. So I feel like the whole time my leg muscles are, are tense. And so when I came down last night and was getting ready for bed, I'm like, oh, my goodness, I feel my legs. <laughs> so I was a little concerned about this morning because I woke up and I still felt tired. And I'm like, you know what? That's when you have thoughts as a pastor, as a preacher. I'll just preach a little quick little message and, and let people go, and I'll go home and get some rest. But there's something about this, that when you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And I love what I do. Amen. I love preaching. I love teaching you all. I love uh, being here with you guys and sharing the word with you. I love worshiping with you. I love praising God with you. Amen. And so... When, it, when you love what you do, it's not like work. But here's where the work began for Jehoshaphat and his army. And here's what the work was. Your Bible will tell you this. They went out into the field where all of the enemy, those three nations that had turned on themselves and destroyed one another, and they were three days in picking up the spoil. Now, I don't know why the armies all went out with their treasure. <laughs> there was gold, and there was silver, and there was all kinds of treasure that they had carried out onto the battlefield. With I don't know why they did that. That doesn't make sense. But God knew it. God knew it, and he knew exactly what to do to bring the enemy's defeat, and he knew exactly what to do to get Jehoshaphat and Judah out of the corner, and he knew exactly what to do uh, that when they came out of that corner that they would be three days in picking up the spoil from the enemy. Can you imagine... Three whole days of just trying to pick up gold and jewelry and wealth and riches and coins and... Oh, my goodness. So I'm just telling you, in one moment of doing what God said to do, their entire situation changed. So I'm telling you this morning... That what I'm really saying to you is that God is way bigger than what we've been allowing God to be in our lives. God can do way more than what we've been allowing and what we've been expecting Him to do. God turned that situation around in a moment. God turned the situation around for um, Elijah in 1 Kings 18. It was turned around in a moment. Why? Because at your word I have done all of these things. And so if we would get to the place where, you know, if God doesn't tell me what to do, I don't know what to do. I'm not doing anything until I hear from God, until God speaks to me. And when he speaks to me, I will not do anything but what God has told me to do. And when I do what God tells me to do, then I am going to experience an outpouring of the miracle that God has planned for me and my life and my family and my finances and my physical body and whatever is concerning me. I know it's going to meet head on with a miracle because that's the God that I serve. <sighs> Hallelujah. You can't tell I'm tired at all <laughs> this morning, probably. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 4. And we'll start wrapping it up right here. And uh, this is, last week was communion Sunday, but we were gone, so we postponed that for a week. We'll have communion here in just a moment. Praise the Lord. God is so much bigger. You know, one of the things that I, I wish will not happen for every one of us, that I wish will not happen for you. 
that I wish will not happen for me is that we get to heaven and find out everything that God had for us that we didn't tap into. I don't want that to happen for you. I don't want that to happen for me. I want to get to heaven and God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that if we don't tap into everything that God's not going to say that. But I, I, I want to feel the fullness of that. You know what I'm saying? I want to get to heaven and God say, John, <laughs> awesome job. You did it. <laughs> and I'll be like, God, oh, no, you did it. Thank you. Oh, you were amazing. You know, when I heard that you're so much bigger than, than what I was believing for, and, and I just decided to take all the limits off and watch what you could do in my life. Oh, my goodness, you, was, you just, like, astounded me day after day after day after day. Oh, my goodness, God, you're just so amazing. That's what I want. That's what I want to see happen for you. Hallelujah. Second Kings chapter 4. Praise the Lord. God wants to make your name great. Hmm. We're just going to touch on some things here in chapter 4. A lot of, lot of rich stuff in here. Uh, starts out with, with uh, Elisha's widow who ran out of oil who, or who had oil. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, A servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant did fear the Lord, and the creditors come to take unto him my two sons to be bonded. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your handmaid has not anything in the house except a pot of oil. And then he said, Go borrow vessels, not a few. Borrow as many vessels as you can, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when you come in... You'll shut the door upon you and upon your sons, and you'll pour out into all these vessels, and you shall set aside that which is full. So uh, here's one of the main points that I'm, I'm trying to get you to uh, receive. Last time I talked about this, as well as this morning, this afternoon, is that God is capable of way, 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 way more than what we have experienced to date. God is he's capable of far more. Well, how do we get them to do it? I've been telling you how to get them to do it. All right? You get them to do it by doing what he tells you to do. Amen. And God, he, you know, he'll probably start you out with something reasonable, something small. Like, you know, he used to start me out with, pick up that piece of trash that somebody threw down in the parking lot at Save the Hut. I'm like, well, God, that ain't my trash. I didn't ask you if it was your trash. <laughs> Amen. He just says, pick it up. Well, what happens when you pick it up? Well, sometimes God tells you to do something because he's building character in your life, and he's, he's training you to obey him when it comes time for you to do something else that you're not going to resist that, and you're not going to tell him, well, God, that's not, you know, I'm not ready for that. That's not for me to do. When, when God speaks to you and tells you, you know, you're going in to save a lot, God, uh, and God speaks to you and tells you, no, I want you to go over that person and, and tell them, hey, they, they've been experiencing some problems with, uh, with their oldest son, He's, uh, he's been sick. He's in the hospital. She's concerned about him. She's really uh, uh, scared that he's not going to make it. I want you to go up to her and tell her that, and that God says that he's going to touch her son, and he's not going to die, but he's going to live and declare the works of the Lord. And if you're not used to hearing from God, and you're not used to uh, God telling you to do stuff, then you'll just blow that off and be like, Psh, well, I, you know, I've never done anything like that. That can't be God. But God wants to do some miracles. God wants to touch some people. God wants to make your name great by making his name great inside of you. Hallelujah. And so how do you get God to show up big in your life? You've got to do what he tells you to do. That's, that's the whole thing of it. You've got to do what he tells you to do. And so this widow, uh, even though Elisha, Elisha here tells her what to do, this is the word of the Lord, go borrow vessels. She could have said, that's ridiculous. What am I going to do with a bunch of empty vessels? All I got is a little bit of bowl of oil here. It's not going to fill one of these vessels. So our, our responsibility is not to question the word of God. Our responsibility is to obey the word of God in faith with an expectation that when we obey what God tells us to do, that there's going to be a miracle that is released in our life. 
God is a supernatural thing. He's a supernatural God above all other things. He is supernatural. To limit God to just natural is a mistake. And so the widow did that. She, she did what Elisha told her to do. And what happened? Every one of those vessels was filled until she ran out of vessels. And then the oil dried up, right? So now she's got a house full of vessels, vessels full of oil. What do you do next? I need, a, I need another instruction. Now I've got a bunch of vessels in the house. I've got the bedroom full of vessels. I've got the den full of vessels. The dining room full of vessels. The, the living room over here, the kitchen's full. I, I, the whole house is full of vessels. All the vessels are full of oil. Those things are heavy, too. So what do I do now? God didn't leave her without an additional instruction. The next thing he does, what, he, what does he do? He tells her, go and sell these vessels of oil and pay off your debt and then that was just a, a short moment she went from getting ready facing the, the, the possibility of losing her two sons as bond slaves because of a debt that her husband racked up and in just a moment her debt is completely paid off and the prophet says, now you and your family live off of the rest. That is a life-changing moment. You live off the rest. You're not going to have to work. You're not, not going to have to worry. You're not going to have to be afraid of how you're going to do this, how you're going to buy clothes, how you're going to put the kids through school, how you're going to get food on the table. No, nope. all taken care of. Live off of the rest. Hallelujah. That is the kind of God that he wants you to see him as. Bigger, better. I almost started to name the message this. Bigger, better, faster, stronger. <laughs> he's bigger, he's better, he's faster and stronger than what you have been thinking. Amen. Let's just hit a couple more, more highlights here. And so she did that. Um, we'll, we'll skip here uh, verse 18 you know there was a there was a Shunammite woman here she built a house and so Elisha and his servant would stop in there and stay they would feed them and then they would they would stay in the room that they, they built had built for for him and uh, uh, so finally Elisha says to his servant go find out what she wants you give you give you give you give you give enough finally like Cornelius in, uh, in the Bible, in the book of Acts chapter 10, you give, give enough, you give long enough, finally God's going to say, what, what do you want? And it's almost like at that moment, he's saying, I'm giving you a blank check. What do you want? And she says, basically, I, I have everything. I, you know, she wasn't poor. She was a, a wealthy woman. He's like, I don't need anything. And his servant spoke to him, and he says, her husband is old, and she doesn't have any kids. And so Elisha's like, ah, gotcha. This time next year, you will have a son. And she wasn't really even ready to receive that. She was like, hey, don't mess with me. <laughs> don't tell me something that's not going to come to that. He said, I'll listen, I promise you. This time next year, you will embrace a, a baby boy. You're going to have a baby, and that's exactly what happened. And so uh, what happened? The baby, the boy was growing up. He was out in the field with his father one day. He gets, uh, he gets sick, like having heat exhaustion or whatever. He was, his head was hurting. He, he sent, him, uh, sent him back to the house uh, to be with his mom, and he died on his mom's lap. And here's this woman. I've been given to the prophet. I've been given to the prophet. I've been given to the prophet. God gave me this boy. And now he's, he's gone, but, you know, I had this conversation. She remembered it. Don't mess with me. Don't do this. And so she gets on her Harley Davidson, and she <laughs> heads off toward the prophet. 
And his servant meets her. And then he meets her, and he says, what's going on? She says, all is well. All is well. And he finds out, well, the little boy has died. So he goes into where the, the little boy was laid, and he stretches himself out. I would just give you the, the short version of this. He stretches himself out on the child. And obviously, you know, he's doing what God is showing him to do. And the boy is revived, comes back to life. And so, you know, here, here's the point of this. What is the point of it? The point is this, that when God gives you something and then it seems like it's been taken away from you, listen, <laughs> that's not the time for you to lose the fight in the corner. That's the time for you to rise up. No, 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 all is well. I told you not to mess with me, and, and so I'm not giving up. I'm not letting this be the end. So listen, whatever you might be facing, that maybe the enemy is trying to do something in your life. Maybe the enemy is trying to limit you in your finances. Maybe the enemy is trying to limit you on your career, in your career or your job or your whatever your situation is or something going on in your physical body. And the enemy is trying to tell you, this is the way it is. This is just the way it's always going to be. It's just going to keep getting worse from this point. There's no point in you trying. No, 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 no. This is not the way that this ends. I'm not going down. I'm not getting punched in the face in the corner, I'm coming out of the corner, and it's not just so that I can lose in, in, a, in the middle of the ring, I'm coming out of the corner to win this battle, I'm coming out of the corner to win this fight, I will win it because God gave me healing, God gave me his word, I did what he told me to do, and now I am not going to lose at this point just because it looks like what God gave me has been taken away from me, I am getting back everything that God promised. That's what her attitude was. I'm not letting the enemy steal anything from me. And that's the attitude that we have to have. I am not allowing the enemy to take not one single thing from me. God gave it to me. God is not taking away from me because he does not give and take away like Job said. That was, Job said that, but he didn't, that's not the truth. Well, it's in the Bible, Pastor John. Yeah, he, he, yeah, the Bible records accurately what Job said. But what Job said was not true. How many of you know everything that everybody said in the Bible doesn't, doesn't mean that what they said was true? Amen? There's some people in the Bible that lied. <laughs> I'm not saying Job lied, but Job was just saying what he thought was true. But God does not give and then take away. Well, he does. He gives life. He takes away sin. He takes away disease. He takes away sickness. He takes away poverty. He takes away the curse. God gives life. He gives blessing. He gives favor. He takes away everything that's bad. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So she got her boy back. I want to just, we'll wrap up at the end of this chapter. So this is, uh, this is so interesting. Um, you know, in the, uh, in the Gospels, when Jesus takes the bread and the fish and multiplies them, you know, the little boy's lunch. And um, <laughs> I read this the other day. I had, I've read through the Bible several times, and I don't ever remember seeing this. But obviously Jesus had seen this. And Elisha had a guy that came to him and brought him, let's see, there came a man, verse 42. There came a man from uh, Baal Shalisha, and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley, and full ears of corn in the husk thereof. And Elisha says to him, Give unto the people that they may eat. And his servant said, What? Should I set this before a hundred men? And Elijah, Elisha gave him the tilt. <laughs> he doesn't change what he said. He said, Give it to the people that they may eat. And then he fills in the, the blank there and he says, The Lord says they will all eat and there will be leftovers. Hallelujah. For those of you that like leftovers, <laughs> amen. And so when Jesus in the Gospels is uh, there before the crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children, he read First King, or Second Kings chapter 4. He knows this is not the first time that God ever had to multiply bread and food for a crowd of people. 
It's not beyond God's ability to be able to multiply provision and supply. And so uh, this is exactly what happened. They set the food before those people in 2 Kings 4, and they all ate. And what happened? Exactly what God said would happen, happened. They all ate, and there was leftovers. Explain that. You can't explain it in the natural. When, when Elisha told the servant to do that, it doesn't make sense. We're going to end up looking silly. We're going to end up looking foolish. But not when you do what God says to do. When you do what God says to do, you are opening yourself up to receive the supernatural, miraculous power of God breaking forth into your life like never before. Hallelujah. That's when God makes a difference between you and other people. That's when God says, I'm making your name great because I'm on the inside of you. And when he does that, listen, here's your appropriate response. You do not keep your mouth shut. You open your mouth. You begin to blabber about it. You begin to testify about it. You tell your neighbor about it. You tell your coworker about it. You tell your mom and dad about it. You tell your family about it. You tell everybody that you can tell about it. And you say, you're not going to believe what God did for me. This is what God did. I believe God. God said to do this. I did it. And when I did it, God broke out into my life in a supernatural way. And here's the miracle that happened to, to prove that God is bigger than what you have ever even thought that he could be. And you don't keep your mouth shut about it. You testify about it and you, you share it and you tell everybody and you put it on Facebook, but it's not official until it's on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's all stand. Come up and get your communion. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You are an amazing God. Thank you. How many of you know the kingdom is yours? Amen. You have authority. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. In the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, the Apostle Paul writes there, he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. Ooh, look at that. Did anybody get two? Did anybody not get one? Everybody got one? You need another one? <laughs> okay. That was the perfect amount. Yeah. When he had given thanks, you got one, right? Okay. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. So we just talked about breaking bread, multiplying it. Well, you know, when Jesus, he said, this bread represents my body. Hasn't that been multiplied? I mean, so much. We don't even know the numbers of people throughout history that have become born again and a part of the body of Christ. But Jesus knew a thing or two about breaking the bread. When he had that little boy's fish, bread, bread and fish, the Bible says he broke it and blessed it and he gave it. It's exactly what he did with his body. He allowed it to be broken. It was blessed. And then he gave it. And it multiplied and continues to multiply today. Amen. And so this is my body, which is for you. Do this. In remembrance of me. We're just going to take a moment and just thank the Lord and what he did, what he continues to do. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We give you thanks this morning. Thank you for redeeming us from our curses. 
God, thank you for giving us a revelation of your bigness in our lives. We're going to expect more. We're going to believe you for more. We're going to see more. We're going to do more. As you tell us what to do, Lord, we're going to do it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, He is to eat of that bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. I always like to point out the fact that what that is talking about there, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. That means die, because they do not rightly judge the body of Christ. That means the people sitting around you. That means the one sitting in your seat. God expects you to judge yourself righteously, because you have been washed with the blood of Jesus. To consider yourself a heathen or a sinner when you have been cleansed by his blood is to improperly judge yourself and those around you. I think God's opinion of that is a lot stronger than what we realize when God says, listen, you don't judge your sisters, you don't judge your brother, you judge them the way I judge them. I judge them forgiven, I judge them righteous, I judge them right. Amen. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we receive of this cup right now judging ourselves the way you do and each other the way that you do. We have been redeemed in Christ, Lord. We are cleansed and washed in the blood of Jesus. Eastern Kentucky shall be saved and washed in the blood of Jesus. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' almighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Did y'all get anything out of that this morning? Good, 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 good. Well, if you need a special prayer for anything, 